This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to the podcast of Man Library's Chats and Stacks Book Talk series. In today's talk, originally presented at Man Library on March 12, 2008, Stephen Kress from the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology discusses the second edition of his book, The Audubon Society Guide for Attracting Birds, Creating Natural Habitats for Properties Large and Small. Owners of properties of all sizes can attract a greater number and variety of birds by planting vegetation in a manner that mimics natural plant communities. Stephen Kress discusses how native plants attract birds with sweet fruits in the summer, fatty foods just in time for migration, fruits high in carbohydrates over the winter, as well as nesting sites and shelter from extreme weather in all seasons. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to be part of this uh, series and to be able to share interest in um, gardens and birds. It, I think it's an especially appropriate topic for this time of year uh, while we are kind of itching to get our hands back in the ground and the birds are itching to come home. Uh, this topic really uh, brings together the two most popular outdoor hobbies that, that people have in this country. Gardening is, is by far the uh, most popular activity, uh, but birds is also extremely popular and is second actually to, to gardening if you count backyard bird feeders and, and such as, as bird watching, and, and it's a certainly a good place to start. Now, you heard a little bit about my interest in attracting uh, puffins and seabirds to islands off the coast of Maine. The connection to uh, bird gardens is simply this, is that our yards functionally can be like islands. Uh, they can be islands of suitable habitat uh, for nesting, but especially during migration when birds are flying over, they are attracted to, to habitat, habitat in which they are most familiar to. So by creating islands of suitable habitat on properties large and small, uh, which is the subtitle for the book that we have out on the table, uh, you can help increase the variety of birds that come to your yard. And so I'm gonna be giving you some tips about how to do that, especially in the second part of this program, but First, I want to talk about some of the interrelationships between birds and plants, because uh, with these, um, this understanding, you can, I think, better understand why some of the suggestions I'm going to make um, are practical. Uh, we will be talking about all different scales of gardens. I do have in the lower right corner a picture of the rooftop garden on the Chicago Town Hall, a famous uh, you know, inner city garden. Um, a, a photo from our own Cornell plantations in the lower left to remind us that we don't have to go too far to find uh, some really great model bird habitat. And we'll talk about um, not just plants, but nesting habitat and water and just keeping your uh, bird garden a safe place for birds when they visit. One thing I will not be talking about specifically in this talk is bird feeding in this kind of sense, that is putting out seed. Uh, clearly, these evening grosbeaks are benefiting from it, but I, I, I'm among those that believe that most wild birds are not yet on kind of a welfare uh, society, that they haven't been doing this for so long that they uh, would perish without it. Uh, we may have expanded the ranges of some species by the supplemental feeding, but by and large, uh, bird feeding provides only one of the needs of birds, that is food, for only a relatively few species, and it does nothing for cover or for water or for nesting places or shelter in extreme weather. So um, it has li relatively limited ephemeral value. It's much more useful to think about what birds were doing before there were uh, bird feeders. And what did they eat before there were uh, this cornucopia of sunflower seeds sort of pouring out of uh, bird feeders? And for the evening grosbeak, we don't have to look too far to find that it and most other seed-eating birds really are eating this uh, fantastic banquet of native seeds and berries uh, that are produced by our own native trees. 
And certainly high on that list, one of the, one of the most long-lived and glorious uh, species is the sugar maple that, that thrives uh, in upstate uh, New York. Uh, that evening, grosbeak, uh, before it came to eat sunflower seeds, uh, fed mostly on the seeds of maples and the flowers of maples, as do uh, many other kinds of trees. But see, something like a sugar maple does much more than provide food. It has a furrowed bark in which uh, woodpeckers and nuthatches and creepers can dig out all kinds of, of tiny little insect prey throughout the year. It also has cavities in which uh, uh, screech owls and many cavity nesting birds uh, might find shelter and nesting places. So uh, planting a tree, which is one of the themes, underlying themes of this talk, you're doing something for a wide range of birds through many generations, not just bird generations, but human generations, because a sugar maple may live three to 400 uh, years. And so, with that kind of philosophy, when I was house hunting a few years ago, and I was looking around town to find a house, I was thrilled to find a property up on Snyder Hill uh, Road, where I live with my uh, wife and, and daughter. Uh, and the first thing that struck my eye, it was fall, was this glorious row of sugar maples along the driveway, which thought, this could be the place. I really, I really wasn't too excited about the house. It was kind of an uninteresting house, but the driveway was fantastic. <laughs> and, you know, and there were these native trees that the previous owner had had the, the thoughtfulness to plant, and they were still young, and they had hundreds of years ahead of them. So I thought, this, this, this could be a good home for me, as well as the birds that um, would probably come to these trees. And in fact, that, that is what's that's happening. The acres that I bought there, uh, as time uh, and travels permit, I've been trying out many different techniques for attracting birds. And many of the ideas that I, I've written about in my book, um, The Audubon Guide to Attracting Birds, are, are tested on this property. And it's, it's, uh, it's given me both opportunities to experiment, but also a sense of humbleness about the difficulties of gardening, which is, which is a no easy thing. Now, getting back to this idea about birds and plants and, and why, why you need to think carefully about the plants if you want to attract particular kinds of birds is because birds are intimately co-evolved with plants. Uh, this gray catbird, for example, uh, has a gape size, that is the, the, the width of its, uh, its uh, mouth opening, to swallow only native plants. Three-fifths of an inch in diameter is the uh, largest fruits that it can swallow. There are 300 kinds of trees, shrubs, vines, and even ground covers that depend upon birds to distribute their seeds in uh, eastern North America alone. None of those uh, have um, fruits, if they're going to be swallowed, wider than the gape of, a, of an American robin, which is a little bit larger than the catbird, which is another one of the seed distributors. There's a wide range of birds that eat fruits. Some of them, however, are really good at it and very important for the birds. The catbird and its close relative, the mockingbird and brown thrasher are high on the list. All the thrushes, from the robin, the big old robin, on down to the little eastern bluebird, uh, they all are very important uh, distributors of seeds. Uh, but even birds like uh, vireos and woodpeckers and warblers at certain times of the year will turn to seeds. Now, it's easy to see why a bird would come to eat the fruit, because it gets benefit. <coughs> but why is it that 300 kinds of plants have evolved mechanisms, sizes of fruits, and timing of dispersal to attract birds? Because birds are the perfect distributor of their fruits. First of all, they don't have teeth. You know, I, I, there's, they don't destroy the seed. They do swallow it. It does pass through a gizzard with little bits of sand and grit and gravel, but that just sheds off the exterior. It leaves the seeds themselves intact and uh, fertile without destroying them. Contrast to that to mice that, that can chew through most larger seeds and end up eating the seed uh, as well as the fruit. So birds are perfect for this. The other thing is they have such a high metabolism. With an average body temperature of about 102 
uh, degrees, the um, birds have to eat a lot. They have to eat a lot. And because they, they uh, have to stay light, they can't carry a lot at any one time. So they're constantly eating it, stripping off the, the nutritious exteriors of uh, fruits, uh, getting the uh, content, and then, of course, passing the rest of it right out. And so they're like, uh, they're like liberally spreading these seeds all over the landscape all the time as they're maintaining their high body temperature. And of course, they fly much better than most mammals. Even the flying squirrel can't keep up with the slowest of our birds. So uh, birds are just great at this. It's the perfect system for moving seeds away from the lethal fate of falling under the parent tree because if the seed just dropped to the ground, it would be in the worst possible growing condition. It'd be competing with its own parent for, shade, for, for uh, sunlight and for water, and it would be doomed. And that's why you don't generally see many plants growing under their parents. Uh, they require some method of getting away. And birds, for many, many plants, are, are the ideal distributor of seeds. Of course, wind uh, also carries some away, but, but birds are actually the primary distributor of most of our important trees, shrubs, vines. Um, and highest on that list, right up there, probably beyond the thrushes and the catbirds, uh, are the, ce uh, the cedar waxwings. No less than 70% of their diet is made up of fruit. In fact, the bird even is named after one of its favorite foods, the red cedar, which it nests in and which it eats the fruits. The fruits pass through the, the digestive tract of the bird. They are uh, scarified. They uh, have a higher chance of, uh, of germinating. In fact, some experiments have been done where the, the juniper fruits were planted without going through a bird and they don't germinate at all. And so we can be pretty sure that almost all the red cedars that we see scattered over the landscape had a history at one time or another of passing through a bird. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to picture birds sitting on this fence some in previous uh, time and, it, and uh, doing what they do so well. You've probably seen this on your car from time to time <laughs> as well. So there they go. The seed falls right to the ground and, it's, and as if that wasn't enough uh, to benefit the seed, they uh, send a little bit of high nitrogen fertilizer right with it, so which gives it a little, a little boost from the beginning. There's a close-up of those little waxy uh, cedar uh, fruits. Uh, the wax protects the seed inside and, and requires the bird to actually strip it away so that the seed will grow. There are some seeds that are too big for birds to actually swallow. This uh, scrub jay, uh, has got an acorn in his beak. It could just as well be a blue jay. And it's likely that many of the oak trees that we have in this part of the world were planted by blue jays because blue jays and scrub jays, all the jays and crows as well, are, are great at, at hiding uh, acorns. And they will bury them and then they'll go back and dig them up. Uh, they are able to actually remember exactly where they planted, uh, where they buried it. And even if you get a foot or more of snow, the jays can remember the location because of trees that are growing up. It's pretty amazing, but they can find that acorn, tunnel through the snow, and, and excavate it. The Clark's Nutcracker, a mountain jay of the west, can go through more than two feet of snow uh, to find its caches of food. Now, caching is not unique to uh, jays. Uh, most of our little birds that come to feeders, if you watch them, you'll see them doing the same thing, even little chickadees. They don't eat all those seeds you see flying. They'll eat a lot of them, but they fly away and they stick them here and they stick them there, and uh, sometimes they'll grow into new, into new plants. But whole oak forests are probably uh, due to our jays, and, and I think jays, because of that, they need sort of a little extra respect. A lot of people that, that you know, feed sunflower seeds, they maybe had it with jays because they think they're eating up all their expensive black oil sunflower seeds, but in nature, they are great gardeners, and, and they are planting forests that permit many other species to live. Now, as bird gardeners, we should keep in mind that, not, that even the birds that eat fruits and seeds and acorns all 
when they're raising their own young, switch to insects. Um, it's clear, you know, when you see something like a warbler feeding its young bugs. But here's a grasshopper sparrow, a seed-eating bird, bird with the remains of a little grasshopper in its beak. Even gross beaks, even cardinals, these birds with big seed-cracking beaks, they feed their young insects. And they do it because uh, the insects are made up of 70% protein, far more than they would get of eating food. And young nestling birds, it's all about protein. They have to grow hundreds of feathers. They've got to put meat on. They have to develop bones. They need lots of protein. And they've got to raise those young quickly before the predators find them. It takes about two weeks for a baby robin from the time it hatches, the time it's as big as its parent, and it's all powered by earthworms and insects, and it's not eating much fruit and berries at that time of year. Even a little Nashville warbler, like this one, although it has an insect-eating beak, come fall, it switches its food to uh, fruit. Not just any fruit, but over time, they've developed a taste to be able to recognize fatty compounds called lipids that are in certain kinds of fruits. And they are attracted more to those fruits. And certain trees have, in their own way, kind of learned that they can be more successful in distributing their fruit if they have lipids in their fruit. This is one of my favorite bird attracting trees, a flowering dogwood photographed here in the plantations in the spring. Um, this is not at the season when birds use the flowering dogwood, but it does illustrate how a native tree can be one of the most spectacular plants you could ever hope to plant in your garden. It's the fall when the fruits are red that the birds are flock into eating the uh, fruits of the flowering dogwood. These, this uh, cluster of fruits uh, illustrate all the, all the characteristics, really, that, that often surround um, a bird-attracting plant. First of all, they're bright red. Birds can see color. And so they are, uh, have learned over time to be attracted to red. It represents ripe fruit. These are just the right size, not too big, or they couldn't be swallowed. Contrast the fruit of the flowering dogwood with the kusa dogwood, a Korean um, substitute that the garden shops are trying to sell, but those fruits are fused together into a big uh, mass, and the birds can't swallow it and rarely take the time to pick through and eat any of the fruit of a kusa dogwood. So even though it, it, um, it's closely related, it's not from around here, and our birds uh, really are not too interested in it. Oh, let me get back to this. Another interesting thing about native trees is that their fruit ripens just at the right season so that the fruits are present when the birds are migrating through. The dogwoods have figured it out over time. The peak of the fruiting, when the fruits are red, when the seeds are mature inside, should happen when the peak of the fruit-eating migrants, such as the thrushes, are migrating through. It's remarkable, the timing. This has taken thousands of years to work out. Those plants that didn't had their timing off, well, they weren't selected for. Those plants that had their fruits too large, forget it, they weren't eaten. But the ones that had the right size, the right color, the right timing, the right fat amount, they were snapped up. There's been a lot of selection, and the birds are doing it all the time. Now that said, when you start thinking about this, that all sounds pretty good for the flowering dogwood, but what about the gray dogwood. Birds eat that also, and its fruits are white. And there are lots of other kinds of bird-attracting plants where the fruits are either white or black or blue. And interesting about these is that they attract birds, they signal birds to, to eat their fruit, not with the fruit so much, but with the leaves. This is gray dogwood uh, about a week later when the leaves have been, uh, the chlorophyll has been killed by an enzyme advertising to the birds that the fruit is ready to eat. The plants, if the bird came too early and ate the fruits before the seeds were mature inside, it wouldn't be doing the, the, bird, the plant any good. So the timing is very important. And, <clears throat> and the plants thus have this foliage flag. Not all of our fall colors are because of this, but those plants which are distributed by birds frequently are. 
And there's many examples of it. Here's another um, blue-fruited uh, native plant, the Virginia creeper, which is a great bird attracting plant. Look how the brilliant red leaves. This, this says, eat me, my fruits are ready. Come, come to the table. Washington hawthorn is an interesting bird attracting plant, one of my favorites. Hawthorns are, are great for birds. They have fruit. They have a good nesting structure to support nests. They have thorns to keep predators out. Um, these fruits uh, in the fall, when the leaves start coming off, are ripe. They're the right color. They're, they're uh, the right size. But usually, this time of year, they're still hanging on the tree. And you might, if you see this on, on some trees, you might say, what's wrong with this? Is it, a, is it uh, what's gone astray. I mean, any examples of this kind of, um, what seem to be neglected fruits. Here's high bush cranberry viburnum. Looks like this in the fall, and the leaves are just starting to get some color. It's a beautiful uh, landscaping plant. But in the winter, the leaves fall off, and the fruit is still there. It's getting all shriveled up, and looks like a mistake. And, but don't worry, they're, they're, I think there's a reason for this, and that is that these are, these are generally low fat fruits, um, and they're hanging on the tree. They're not eaten right away. They're hanging on the tree um, for late winter and spring, and that's the season. Like right now, March is a great time of year for birds like waxwings and robins when they first come back to find something left. So when you're plant making your selections for trees, it's good to have some high-fat fruits like the uh, spice bush and like the flowering dogwood and magnolias and sassafras and some low fat fruits like crab apples, high bush cranberry, viburnum. Uh, there's the crab apples. They fall in this group of fruits that are not readily eaten. Uh, sometimes they're on all winter. Sometimes they freeze and they fall several times. And by the time the birds do eat them, they're fermented already. And the birds get a little loopy. And if you ever see birds like on the ground acting a little stunned, it may be because your, uh, your crab apples have turned into hard cider. But that's the kind of fruit that wintering birds just love, like pine grosbeaks. This was a winter for some northern pine grosbeaks. And a few were seen in Ithaca, some were seen just north of here. Um, <coughs> and the people that have these up are likely the ones that to, to uh, reap the benefit of pine grosbeaks. Uh, cedar waxwings, when bohemian waxwings come our way, they always show up in these ornamental uh, crab apples. And let's think about uh, fruits for spring and summer, because some birds do eat fruits in this season. Here's the family of grosbeaks again, uh, this time feeding black cherries to a, to a, a nestling. Uh, black cherries, uh, blueberries, huckleberries, um, elderberries, raspberries, uh, all are sweet fruits uh, fed uh, because of the high sugar content, usually supplementing insects uh, for nestling birds in the summer. Adults eat them as well. Um, and my apologies if I happen to have photographed your house. Uh, I did take this picture here in Ithaca. I won't say exactly where, but um, it is typical of what's happening in our, in our country. About two million acres a year of uh, rural lands are being transformed into suburbia. An area the size already of Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, and, and Vermont, uh, and uh, Connecticut are already uh, totally lawn. All those, an area the size of all those states is, is lawn. It's a monoculture and bird attracting and bird habitat most of it has taken the place of much more productive habitats. It's a huge thing, and there's no obvious end in sight to the amount of transformation of habitat into suburbs. However, I'm among those that believe that this habitat can be helpful, for at least for some kinds of birds. Initially, it'll be kind of like uh, shrubland birds. Later, it may be more forest birds if people do the right things. And I just want to, I want to give you a few more examples. First of all, keep in mind that this monoculture of lawn that we have such a fascination with in this country um, has got several problems. First of all, it, it doesn't hold uh, water very well. Water runs right down through it and into 
into sewers. Uh, to get a beautiful grassy lawn like this, it's probably been treated with chemicals. And those chemicals leave the lawn and then head off uh, to kill um, wildlife, um, often far away. An estimated uh, 7 million birds die every year uh, from uh, eating contaminated food in lawns. Uh, this robin could well have a load of contaminated earthworms taken back to its young. However, looking at this lawn, which is made up of broadleaf uh, plants and some clovers, probably it was not a treated lawn. You can tell the treated lawns are generally all grass. Now on that property up on Snyder Hill, what I, what I did uh, was to begin to minimize the, the amount of lawn. The previous owner, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have those big maples and I thank him for that, but he was, he was a little out of control when it came to lawn. And I guess, uh, you know, I don't know why, but he had too much lawn from my view. So I decided to let the lawn grow up and throughout much, and it's the simplest way to deal with too much lawn. I don't have to mow nearly as much lawn, but I still have some near the house. I figure if I, if I let it grow up totally, um, people might think we moved out or something. And, and that's probably part of the problem why people, they want it to look like they still live there. So I think it's important to keep the edges um, sort of mowed. But, but let the lawn grow up further away. So mowing small amounts of lawn is the compromise. It's a rule of thumb. I encourage people to try to find a way they can reduce their lawn by at least 25%, if not more. When you do that, you find that there's all these hidden wildflowers that are just being mowed down all the time. Uh, there are dozens of species of goldenrods and asters and daisy fleabane and, and many other species that have value uh, for birds and for insects. They provide food for insects. The insects provide food uh, for the birds. Um, and as you look at different size fields, if you have the opportunity to let a larger field grow up, you will find it will attract different kinds of birds. Each species of bird has a preference for the size of amount of habitat that it requires. And that's just kind of like built into them. Uh, and there are some tables that show just the, the minimum amount of size that a, a bird, a small field like this, probably uh, would be, if it's about five or six acres, would be just the minimum size for bobolinks. But uh, the bobolinks, if it gets too small, the bobolink then will, will move out. The Eastern meadowlark, on the other hand, requires instinctively, it requires at least 35 acres of contiguous uh, meadow habitat in order to uh, raise its, its family. And if there's even a hedgerow growing up, breaking up that big expanse of field, then the meadowlarks will move on. When we're thinking about things to do in our yard, I think uh, important lessons can be learned from looking at, at natural habitats, to see what kinds of plants are growing there, and also to observe the density. I think it's the density and, and the layering that distinguishes natural habitats from human-made habitats. People tend to look for simple simplicity in our landscaping, and the lawn is, is the extreme case of that. But even breaking the lawn up with an occasional bush or occasional tree probably doesn't do a whole lot of good for the birds. And natural habitat is a very complex place. It's the kind of habitat that a little bird could just like hop its way all the way to the top without having to even fly. Uh, because there's the ground covers, there's understory shrubs, there's higher shrubs, there's understory trees, there's canopy trees, and there's this uh, labyrinth of vines like grapevines and Virginia creeper and poison ivy that are just lacing the whole thing together. Yeah, poison ivy, it's great for birds. I highly recommend it. Uh, I don't suggest you go plant it, but if, if you've got some way out in the woods, leave it be. The birds love it. These kinds of more natural habitats are very birdy places. A birder will see a habitat like this and their hands will immediately kind of move to their binoculars because they know there's going to be a bird popping out of this somewhere. But what is it about this habitat? It's the complexity. It's the shrubs, it's the trees, it's the deciduousness, it's the evergreens, it's the meadow, it's the junction of all these habitats coming together. Hopefully each of these extends out to some depth, but you often find a lot of things together. 
in our backyards, you can strive for this kind of a layering so that you can't see through it. That's a good measure of the, of the usefulness for birds of a habitat. If you totally can't see your neighbors through it, you're developing that, that elevational um, complexity that birds like. And you're, and you're getting a good screen of privacy at the same time. Uh, ground covers, a variety of ground covers are important. This is a, a picture, I think I took this somewhere in Cuga Heights. It's, uh, it's the kind of uh, setting you can get in a more mature uh, habitat. If you go up the top of the Johnson uh, Museum in the summer, you can look out over Cuga Heights, and you can realize it's, you can't even see the houses anymore. It's a mature community where tall trees have closed over, and it's got potential. There are pileated woodpeckers now living in Cuga Heights. It's a forest bird. And they're there because the trees are big enough, the habitat is beginning to mature enough. Each species of bird has its own limits. And if one of the layers is missing that it requires, you'll lose it. Our chipping sparrows are a fairly easy to please bird for the suburbs. They require usually some low cropped lawn in which they feed. They require a low shrub like this taxus uh, or yew shrub to build their nest. They don't nest very high. but. If you just had those two things, you would not have a chipping sparrow. They also need some tall trees, about 20 feet tall, to sing from. That's not too hard to, to uh, meet, and most suburbs can provide that. Hence, there are a lot of chipping sparrows. Most of our forest birds have many more uh, layers of uh, requirement. Now, here's, here's a map of a, of a, uh, a backyard that that you can make. And here's sort of this time of year, this is a great time of year to go through this exercise, is to just do a sketch of your uh, property and put on it the things that you know. This is the inventory. Uh, if you can recognize the trees and shrubs, all the better. And identify what's there, especially the natives. They should be protected because uh, that's your goal, is to try to have the native plants for the reasons that I've, I've mentioned. But let's look at this and think about some of the ways to improve that same rather simple uh, scene. First of all, let's see if I can use this arrow as a pointer. Notice that um, it was all lawn before, but now we've got a lot of open uh, low grass here. Notice too that the plants that have been put in have been put in in masses. Not individual plants, but clumps of similar kinds of, of trees and shrubs. So that when they come into fruit, they come into fruit at the same time and create a massive attraction, functionally like one plant. Also, they're going to produce more fruit if you've got mass together because they can cross-pollinate better. And that's critical for some dioecious plants that have male and female independent plants like the hollies. Um, notice that there's lots of shrubs sort of around the house as well. Many kinds of birds prefer to nest very close to houses. They seem to instinctively know they're safer if they uh, build their nest near where people are. Less likely to be uh, attacked by raccoons and, and predators if they're near the scent of humans. It's an interesting thing. They often build their, their nest right over your door or in a shrub. I mean, they, they may have a territory of an acre or more, but they're going to be right in literally in your face and it's some people find that annoying they got to go through the back door because the phoebe's built its nest over your front door but the birds are not stupid they're, they're like uh, trying to uh, take advantage of your presence and they they have learned to be safer around people it's a good idea to plant tall trees at the periphery of the property and shorter and shorter ones until you get into into tall uh, grass you form a lawn and so you can look back at this uh, step-like um, display of birds. The pond has been planted with some emergent plants on this end to perhaps attract some water birds during, um, during migration. Maybe even a mallard will now nest here. Um, or maybe some migratory ducks might stop in and rest and, and fatten up a little bit. Um, I want to go back and show you this little idea here. This is a, uh, a bird food plot. Um, you, can, you can beat the bird food people at their own game. If you just rototill some of your former lawn, 
take that bag of bird seed from mixed seed from Wegmans or something, <laughs> and then just plant the whole bag, and you'll be growing your own sunflower and millet and milo plants, and and you'll you'll get a lot more for your money if you just plant the bag rather than put it in a bird feeder. Now here's a here's just a sketch to show several different strategies for planting things. The best strategy is the one on top. It's the one I referred to, where you have the the highest trees down, uh, stepping down. Generally, on the north side of the house, it's good to have the conifers because they block the north winds in the winter, and that can save some energy in your house. Um, on the south side, it's best to have deciduous trees. They provide shade in the summer, so you're saving energy from cooling because you've got deciduous trees there in the summer. They lose their leaves in the winter, and then they let sunlight into the house, so you get a little solar gain. Thinking about deciduous trees on the south side, conifers on the north. But the key point for birds is that this is a step down pattern where you're not competing, these different plantings are not competing for light from each other. Contrast that to this where um, the plants were tried to plant under a few established trees, but it's tough and I've tried it, failed consistently. Uh, plants, it's hard enough to grow them uh, at all, let alone under each other. Uh, the only exception to that is uh, creating little islands where you do have a solitary plant and you plant trees around it. Um, for landscape architects, if there's any in the room, I, I always throw this slide in because this is my dream bird habitat. If you're going to be designing a whole neighborhood, if you, or if you uh, know any uh, architects, designers, here's a great bird habitat where the backyards are common land, the houses are all around the outskirts, and you've created uh, habitat for birds in the middle with some nature trails that goes through it. On a much smaller scale than anybody can do, uh, just a few wheelbarrows of topsoil with some rocks uh, and logs and a few brambles on top will attract birds in migration. You'll get more birds in this kind of little microhabitat than you would in just a, a similar plot of lawn, the most sterile of all habitats. Here is a place that wrens and tillies and titmice and juncos can search for little spiders and ants and other kinds of foods. And, and those birds that scratch through leaves like fox sparrows um, and toeys can find things to, to look through. Remember, they need that in the summer to feed their young. And although they may get earthworms early in the year, those earthworms migrate down as the, as the summer proceeds, as the water table drops, and so the lawn won't even provide earthworms uh, come July. But they can get food out of leaves. When you're thinking about your backyard bird sanctuary, remember that many kinds of birds depend on cavities and nest sites. This eastern bluebird is going into a hollow inside of an apple tree, but that's a rare sight anymore. The apple trees are coming down, and wild cavities are being taken up by starlings and house sparrows. So um, on, uh, the easiest way to solve this solution are birdhouses. Here's a tree swallow outside of my house, and it's going in and out of its little box. This one is equipped with a nest guard to keep a raccoon from going in. I think it's a useful way to, a raccoon can't reach his little sharp hand around and inside through that little lip that's there. It gives the birds a little more protection. So if you see a nest box with this, or you want to equip them, or if you have a problem with raccoons, consider that. That's the reason for that. These are so cute, aren't they? Uh, but um, <laughs> they are a big problem for birds, especially this time of year. This is the month, this weekend. I'm going out on my property with a windshield scraper. Hopefully I won't need it in my car that day. And I'm going to open up all the birdhouses and I'm going to remove the nests that are in there. Uh, hopefully there won't be any mice breeding. They're usually not breeding this time of year, but they are keeping warm and cozy in there. And this is the time that the bluebirds are prospecting for nests. Very soon the tree swallows will be back and they will not use, the box might as well not be there because the, the um, the little mice will pack it full. This is, this, is the, this is what I usually find when I open the boxes up. I mean, those mice have been busy all winter long, just bringing all this old bird nest, old sticks and straw. Yeah, 
there probably is an old nest at the bottom of this. And the rest of that is a mouse nest. Now, here's a, here's a nice little trick if you've got a bluebird box, but, but your baby bluebirds are dying from uh, blowflies. This is, this is really an elegant little thing called a blowfly trap. It's made out of hardware cloth. It's just bent, sits in the bottom. At, at night, during the daytime, blowflies migrate down away from light. It's at night they migrate up to the bottom of the nest and kill the baby uh, nestlings. So in this way, they migrate down, but they can't get back up at night. So a lot of people, if you have problems with baby birds dying in your nest, especially bluebirds or tree swallows, just put this little uh, guard in there. Um, the birdhouse, of course, is a relatively simple solution. It can be kind of expensive if you want to have 50 or more up, and it's a lot of work to go around. But you can, you can eat, very economically make your own uh, cavities by playing woodpecker. Um, the, the guy at the top is creating a snag for a woodpecker. If you have woods and not dead trees, you really need some dead trees. So here he's girdling a tree by making a, 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 a removing the cambium tissue three to four inches wide, a band of it right around the trunk. This will kill an aspen uh, or some other short, low, uh, sh uh, slow grow short, fast growing tree and it'll attract woodpeckers, who then will drill holes. Or you can go through the woods with your own drill, as a woodpecker would do. This is an industrious guy with a hand auger, but you can take a power Makita or one of these uh, rechargeable batteries out and do the same thing and in a few hours, create lots of great uh, woodpecker uh, starts, and then let the chickadees and titmice finish out the rest it's best to do this in dead trees. It's not a good idea to do it to your neighbor's trees. <laughs> well, you know, creating cavities is a great thing for the cavity nesters, but what about all the birds that don't nest in cavities, like goldfinches? First of all, it's important to realize that these birds that build cup-shaped nests are looking for very specific branching formations. and, and Many trees just may not have three branches, which is the minimum number they need coming out close together to support a cup-shaped nest. And so they will build their nest in maybe the only place, but they won't reuse the nest. So you can actually benefit um, help birds by removing old worn-out nests because the birds won't reuse these nests. You can also uh, do some careful pruning to help create uh, better nest sites. And these are some examples for creating uh, improved nesting places for cup-shaped nests. After a storm, and we get them this time of year with the ice and the snow, branches fall down. Uh, there'll be a, I'm sure there'll be a, a city cleanup and all, and the city will come around. They'll haul your branches away. Don't let them have them. Hang on to those branches. Those are very useful for birds. That's what birds do in extreme weather, in the extreme summer, extreme winds. They're looking for cover in brush piles. So you can create a brush pile. You can build a foundation. You can cover with large branches. Cover it with conifers if you'd like. You can create a living brush pile like on the bottom. Just lop lower branches, let them fall down. Or pull down uh, young trees to create a living brush pile and tie the crowns down. Here's another thing that goes on. Yeah? What was the drain pipe in the Was that the big small inside? The drain pipes are for cover, added cover. Yeah? Um, little birds getting shelter on inside of that. Toeys, sparrows, juncos uh, find cover during rains and storms. Here's another thing that you see, especially um, in town. People will gather up their leaves in the fall, they'll put them in bags. What a waste. They're just sending them off. Uh, they're, they're, they're taking nutrients off your property and you're giving them away for the town to, to pile in huge heaps. Like, and, you know. But here's what I suggest doing. Uh, rake them under uh, shrubs. Uh, if you've got a teenager, this is my son, I have to admit it's the only time he ever raked the leaves, but if you can find somebody to rake the leaves, um, 
put them under shrubs, they will decompose and they will create um, habitat for birds that will then de scrape through these leaves they, and, and dig out spiders and ants, birds like brown thrashers and white-throated sparrows will scrape through leaves. The invasive plants, uh, many of which are still sold in nurseries, like barberry, are a, a huge problem for native birds. They compete with native plants, like viburnums and uh, dogwoods. And although the birds spread them over the landscape, they end up covering the habitat. And that's the main problem, lowering the diversity, providing a short uh, burst of food, but most of the year uh, not. The only places that they may have some value in areas where there are so many deer that the deer eat everything else. So um, on the table outside um, is a copy of my book. I don't have enough time here to give you all the suggestions that I would give you even for Ithaca, let alone other places around the country. So the book has all that, and it has this whole lecture basically in it. Um, but let me show you a few of my favorites and why I think they work so beautifully. Uh, this is a Washington hawthorn, a native a substory um, plant. Uh, and it's a very decorative tree that provides nesting covers and protection for robins and, and other nesting birds. Uh, the red cedar we talked about earlier. Here it is as a horticultural plant growing uh, near a house, covered in little fruits. Uh, river birch and paper birch are fantastic <coughs> trees for uh, attracting all kinds of birds. Many eat, the in eat insects that they glean off the leaves, but they produce uh, every year a heavy seed crop that falls to the ground and feeds sparrows and juncos, other ground feeders. A nice ornamental that, that grows in our soils here in Ithaca is bayberry, which stays on all winter. Birds eat it through the winter and spring. Any of the shrubby dogwoods are great choices. This is silky dogwood, a, a, a excellent native plant with, with lavender colored fruits. Uh, if you've been to sapsucker woods in, in the early fall, you've probably seen along the roadsides all the little red berries. These are winter berries. It's a type of deciduous holly, a fantastic plant, but you've got to plant a male, at least one to every four uh, females, or you won't get a good crop. The little winter berries. Spice bush is a common understory plant in Ithaca forest, in part because it's tolerant and a deer won't eat it, and so they eat other things, but they leave the spice bush, which is great for the wood thrush and all the other thrushes that migrate through. They love these plump little red fruits. You sometimes have a hard time finding the fruits because as soon as they're ripe, the thrushes swallow them. It's a high fat fruit, very important for migratory long distance migrants. Just a word about flowers. This picture from the plantation shows a few of the favorite plants for hummingbirds, which eat not just nectar, but lots of insects. Our native Columbine is an indicator of hummingbirds. They don't open until the hummingbirds come back. They've co-evolved with our, our ruby-threaded hummingbird. There wouldn't be columbines here. Just picture the hummingbird coming up from underneath as they hover, getting their head tapped with the pollen from the stamens as they go for the bait down inside of the spurs. It just says, come on in, hummingbirds. Cardinal flowers, another example with the... Uh, pollen out on a long stalk. Hummingbird goes in for the nectar, gets tapped on the crown, spreads that to the next flower. What a beautiful design. This system has worked for so long, and we can work with it. We can bring these to our backyard and attract the birds as well. Not just little flowers, but vines as well. Trumpet uh, vine. And um, you can plant these in, in flower pots if you don't have the space. The same species are attractive, whether they're growing in pots or in the ground. Many of the composites are helpful for attracting birds. Here's black-eyed Susan and a blazing star and purple coneflower, three great winners. Uh, but the key thing here is to make sure that you uh, leave the flowers on. Some birds will come when the flowers are, 
have the pedals, but um, they will also come later. Uh, this, this female goldfinch is gathering thistle seed. And say, thistles, oh, I don't want thistles. Well, leave a few thistles, you know. You can maybe take some, take some out or most out, but leave some for the birds and let them go to seed. And leave those uh, echinaceas and sunflowers go to seed in your garden and then you'll be rewarded by the winter goldfinches coming down. So, you know, one of the things that makes people feel pretty good to know that um, if you are a tidy gardener, and you go out and you deadhead every flower, and you rake up everything, you're doing the worst thing. You spent all that time and work, and you've just destroyed the, the garden for birds. So you can be a not so tidy gardener and be doing great things for birds. How many times can you get a good win-win like that? Here's another little project. Mix equal parts of ash, sand, and soil together, and you can create a dust bath uh, for attracting kinds of birds. Put it in a sunny spot, put some rock around it to make it look like an organized project, or just dig a hole in the ground. The birds don't care, and they will come. Another thing you can do is to put some water out for birds. Birds really use water, especially in the summer. Uh, this toey is visiting a puddle. A bird bath is basically a puddle. It's a puddle on a pedestal. The biggest problem with bird baths is that most of them uh, are too deep. You want to get bird baths that are only an inch or two deep, and it's rare to find one. The top of a garbage can is actually a better bird bath than most bird baths because it's shallower top of a metal garbage can. But here's, here's a bird bath. This one, the problem here is it's cement. It was left out in the winter and it's cracked and it's probably gonna not be around much longer. So you gotta bring them in if they're cement or ceramic. This one's also growing algae in it, which means somebody hasn't really scrubbed it out too often. But notice it's shallow and, and this thrasher is, is probably gonna go in for a drink and maybe a dip. At the Lab of O, we have uh, this uh, dripping rock outside of our uh, Treeman bird garden window, and it's uh, it's a, the next step up. It's, it illustrates how dripping water is very attractive to birds, and you can put a little pump in and drip water. Don't buy too big of a pump. You don't want a big fountain. Birds don't like gushers. They don't like roaring waterfalls. They like they're quiet. They're little peaceful animals. You don't want to blow them away with a great stream of water. So drips are just their style. Uh, with that in mind, I created a, a, uh, a bird attracting uh, pool on our property, and I photographed steps. The first step was laying out a, a garden hose just to create the dimensions and visualize what was going to come. The hard part is starting to then dig. This, this um, project was three feet deep because oh, sometimes we get that much ice, not usually, but it should be three feet if you're gonna have fish in it, which I wanted. Next step was to put a layer of, of, uh, of old uh, carpet down because in the winter, when the ground freezes, rocks will start moving up and this protects the rubber liner that is then laid on top of the carpet. Rubber liner is what keeps the water in. That tub is a biological filter because water will be pumped out of this through that filter, which will then uh, have irises growing out of it to take out nitrates out of it when this project is complete. To make it uh, popular for birds, I got a big chunk of slate from up on Quarry Road at the, at the uh, quarry there. A very shallow depression was uh, thermaled out, and they'll do this for you there. There's that big stone on the left side, already collecting some rainwater. Rock is being put down to cover up all that black plastic because you don't want to look at that. That's got to fade away. And here it is, voila. The whole, the black plastic is covered. And, and here's sort of what's going on with the water. There's a pump underwater that pumps the water up through an underground um, plastic hose. That tub is hidden under the rocks, the water then flows through that. There are uh, plants growing in the tub, well-fertilized plants, I might add, because the water's coming up off the bottom full of nitrates. 
produced by uh, little minnows in the water. It then flows into the bird bath and then into the pool where it then recirculates around. Well, I do have to fill this up every now and then because some of the water does evaporate out and does soak into the rocks along the way. But this has really been uh, the most um, attractive project on our whole property for birds. They love this little spot. The key thing is to put it in a place where you can actually see what's going on. And then you just sit there and you watch and, and, and you know, there it is. We have a bird taking a bath in this. Now this might seem like a lot of work to give a red-winged blackbird a bath, <laughs> but they really need it, those, bla those blackbirds. These no, I mean, all the birds could use it, a little bath, and they will come. And, and it greatly enriches your, your backyard, especially if you plant hummingbird plants around it. Uh, and the hummingbirds will frequent this as well. Uh, a few words about protecting your, your windows from uh, birds. Window collisions are thought to kill about a billion birds a year in North America. It's the one, maybe the biggest killer of birds. And some things that don't work, we know, are these silhouettes on the windows. Uh, you might as well save your, your view. They don't work. You have to put them three inches apart to make those work. You have to be on the outside. You wouldn't be able to see out the window if you had that many falcon silhouettes on the window. There are some reflective uh, materials you can put on the outside, especially designed, one-way glass uh, kinds of things. Uh, I think that has worked well at the Lab of Ornithology is fruit tree mesh just stretched over the, over the window. After a while, you don't notice that. You can put this inside of, of window screening uh, frames. But it's having a, um, a window, particularly if birds are hitting it, is, is a big problem. As far as feeder placements go, the research shows the, wind, the feeder has to be within three feet of the window and, uh, or more than 30 feet. If it's real close, the birds don't gather enough momentum. If it's more than 30 feet away, they're not likely to, to uh, they can avoid it. But when a hawk comes and chases up a bunch of birds off the feeder, it can it could, uh, be a problem. The other big problem people have are in their bird gardens are cats. Um, this is our cat. I, we have two cats. They're indoor cats, which I think is fine. Um, but we have to keep the cat entertained. So we show it videos. Um, <laughs> This is videos of, of a rat uh, walking around. We have videos of fish and even videos of birds at feeders. Now, if you have an indoor cat, you don't want a fat cat, right? So you've got to keep the cat entertained. Um, um, Can it control the channel? <laughs> uh, yeah, we haven't worked that out yet. Not all cats like this, by the way. Uh, but this cat loves to look outside, and we think it's, uh, it's mentally fine and uh, and you can see it's enjoying the birds and not uh, destroying, destroying the bird at the same time. So we talked about a lot of things um, in this talk. We've talked about the, the uh, co-evolution of birds and plants, and you can appreciate why native plants are so important. These are the things to consider when you're thinking about your backyard. You know, there's so many things that are affecting bird populations, um, especially the migratory birds cell towers and power lines and car traffic and, and destruction of habitat in this country and, and, um, and, and foreign countries. But we can, I believe, make a difference for birds in our own backyards. And I'm among those that believe that backyard by backyard, we can, we can help these birds from becoming increasingly rare. Start in your backyard, think about reducing lawn, think about putting in native plants, Think about putting them in clumps, uh, providing places where birds can feed throughout the year, where they can find not just fruits, but insects and nesting places and water. And then your backyard will be alive with birds. You'll appreciate not just the flight, but the songs and the color. These are real treasures, uh, and we can bring them closer if we do some of the things that we've talked about here. It's all about um, living closer to nature and understanding the interrelationships. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.